in a generation where there were a lot of gatekeepers. I was a filmmaker originally, then um, was a homeopath, and you know, in each place you see that the sort of the way that we can connect to each other through this new technology, through what's happening right now, means that we could really take our ideas and, and sort of manifest them, make them happen. And, and I think that's what crowdfunding offers. And so we're kind of going to be the people that are going to be using this technology and figuring out what works, what doesn't work. And there's a, you know, there are some experts out there, but they're really new to this as well. So I think you know, the more that we can share, the more we can come to community, like find community, find where our strengths are, who are the people that, you know, what hasn't worked so they won't, we don't have to reinvent the wheel, we don't have to make the same mistakes, or we might just find new things out that nobody else has thought of and you know, other people can kind of work from that, that kind of leverage, that momentum. So that's, that's sort of where this is coming from. Um, and then you see George here. Both of us were filmmakers. I wrote a memoir about being a war journalist when I was in my 20s and went into Afghanistan. And so, you know, something about how to get that out, how to kind of finance the last bit. I also did a Kindle book that was number one in its category on journal writing. So I kind of tested the waters of what's out there and how things can be done. And I also am a homeopath. I treat people in alternative medicine. I ran a school. I've written seven books on homeopathy. So um, that's kind of a bit about my background. So what I thought we could do is just um, pass the mic around. It is a larger audience. It is being recorded. So we're using all the kind of cutting edge, cutting edge um, uh, video recording, broadcasting, everything, and for cutting edge type of projects. I think crowdfunding is really sort of the way to go. It's so much more democratic. It's really our own energies and how we can work together. So I'm just going to pass the mic. I think, you know, take a few minutes, like say who you are, your project, what you want out of this group, and we can take it from there. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name's Salvador. Um, I'm Primarily what I do is I blog for crowdcrux.com and I founded that um, last fall. And that's basically a website where it um, provides tips, useful strategies, and resources for people that are looking to start a crowdfunding campaign. Hi, I'm Beth Raquel. I'm a filmmaker. And uh, we've put a movie up on Kickstarter. And when you're ready, I have a little presentation to tell you about it. Uh, as far as... I have never done this before. Hi, my name is Judy, and I'm new to this all the way around. Um, I'm um, in the process of starting a project, a nonprofit in memory of my husband, and um, I um, just want to make sure I cover all my bases and to raise as, as much um, funds as I possibly can. Um, my, my name is Ruth Walker. I've met Beth at church, and I was just interested in... Um, Finding out what this was all about, just, uh, I've never been invited to help crowdsource a movie, so there. My name is Debbie. I'm the owner of Trav Clean. It's a company that will sell products, germ-free products, to the pe to people on the go. Um, anything from antibacterial spray with no alcohol to handheld items that you can use on planes, trains, anywhere, bathrooms, you know, escalator, elevators. Hi, I'm Dave Lighturi. I'm a, uh, a product developer and a serial entrepreneur. Uh, I've run two successful Kickstarter campaigns. The uh, first one was a $10,000 bid that brought in 200, and the second was a $2,500 bid that brought in 80,000. So we're up, we're up around 170,000 so far. So uh, we've got a third project that's getting ready to go, and um, I'm such a big believer we're going to be doing six of these a year, my son and I. So um, I think it's actually an old idea. We think it's new, but it's old. Uh, back in the 1800s, if you wanted a chair, you'd go talk to the guy that made chairs, and you'd say, I want two of these. You'd give him some money, he'd make them. If you like them, you'd take them. It was just you and him, and that was it. You know? So crowdfunding is really that all over again, but with a new media. The fact that people with ideas and people who would like to support ideas can just meet each other without intermediaries. The disintermediation thing is the most powerful component of it. So, you know, I'm just, I'm fascinated by the economy that's starting to emerge from this space that's opened up between makers, people who make things for friends and family, and traditional manufacturing. So 
Hello, my name is Arlen Dashtuni. Uh, I am really a media and communications person. I've been an editor um, for, you know, majority of my career. And, uh, but I've, you know, um, so I'm interested in ideas, you know, and ideas and how they take shape, you know, what's relevant right now. I think certainly this idea of crowdfunding is very relevant in terms of how we fund, you know, our passion projects and, you know, what, what happens. I think it's kind of catching fire from the sort of smaller passion projects to, you know, bigger, more ambitious ones. That's, I think, where I'm seeing the arc of crowdfunding go. Um, and and I do think this has lots of energy behind it. I fully agree with you. It's not a new idea. You know, we're talking with Melissa about this idea of micropayments and how this was, you know, if you go back to Islamic banking, it's based on this idea. What is different is just that, you know, the, the middleman is kind of disappearing. That's what, you know, uh, web-based ba projects, businesses, everything, that's what they're doing. And let's see where it goes. <laughs> So I just wanted to give a little bit of the format. We have Eli Regalado. I hope I'm pronouncing it right. So he's going to come on from Colorado. He's the co-founder of Videogogo. He has a marketing company. He's also raised over 200000 on Kickstarter and Indiegogo. He's very active on social media. Some of you have heard me say that he's just been extremely helpful, especially on LinkedIn and some of the other um, forums, to just kind of when people have questions, He's just been really on it from real kind of newbie questions to really expert. So I thought it would be great to bring in and, and hear what he has to say. He's going to focus on strategies, and he has a handout if you haven't seen it. So it's in the back there. And then the other person we have is Elon, who's um, also some of you have heard, Amran, who's the founder and CEO of SmoothBiz. It's a forum. He's looking at how to form community and how we can start to kind of on a virtual level, on a social media level, really support each other and and find ways to do that. So he's going to talk about what he's sort of his vision of community in a more virtual context. So what I thought I would do is have Eli talk for like 10 minutes. We can do a Q&A with, you know, with us here live. I'm going to kind of give everybody here precedence. And then um, we'll take questions from the chat board. And then we'll go on to Elon. And then I think we'll have plenty of time to kind of gather back and just see where we're at and what we want to do next. So does that sound okay? All right. So is Eli there? Hey, everybody. My name is Eli Regalado, and I'm the co-founder of Videogogo. We're a full-service marketing agency in Denver, Colorado. And we successfully crowdfunded over $200,000 on Kickstarter and Indiegogo. We're working on two very large projects right now. One of them we're expecting to go over a million. Um, and then two more, one with uh, Angelina Jolie and one with uh, Laura Conrad from The Hills and The O.C. Um, so how I got involved in crowdfunding, I was a business consultant for a private business magazine that went up to the Fortune 1000 CEOs. And I was really hired to start opening um, doors to very influential people. And when I mean very influential, I'm talking like the 0.01% of humanity that's really pushing the needle as far as innovation. So, you know, I've personally met with Steve Wozniak from Apple, Jimmy Wales from Wikipedia, um, various presidents from Central and South America, um, and so on and so forth. So one of the people that I actually met with early on uh, when I was consulting was the CEO of Indiegogo. And this is when crowdfunding was just kind of starting to kind of come on the scene. And I was like, you know, Slava, I am really interested in what you guys are doing. Um, I'd like to take this and, and run with it in some ways, some form. I just need to know how to do it. So I kind of got the inside, you know, kind of one of these from the team. They said, okay, here's everything you need to run a successful crowdfunding campaign. And so a lot of that's what I'm going to be sharing with you here. So with, with crowdfunding, you know, there, in, in any venture, there's nothing worse than putting all your time and energy into something just to see it fail and 60% of all crowdfunding projects fail, and I am fully convinced it's due to a lack of planning on the front end. So if you think about it, um, crowdfunding is almost like the World Wide Web. So in the beginning days of the web, um, you know, it's everyone had this illusion that they were going to create this website, and it was going to be like $100,000 to create one of these you know, really basic HTML things. 
stick it on the web and all of a sudden people are just going to come to it and start giving them money. And we all know kind of what happened with that. You had this dot-com bust. It was just a disaster. And if we don't plan accordingly, the same thing's going to happen with crowdfunding. Okay, so um, crowdfunding, it's, it's all about connecting with your audience. And that's one of the first things that we tell people is, look, if you're not involving your audience first, uh, they're going to sense it. Because a lot of times people come to us and say, okay, here's how much money I want to raise. Here's my product. And I'm just going to think of these perks as almost an afterthought. Like, what can I do to kind of get some money out of them? And what we try to tell people is like, look, it's all about community. It's about conversation. And it's about co-creation. So think of ways that you can involve your audience in the creation of this product. Having them vote on colors. Having them give you feedback on snippets of a reel that you're doing for a movie. Um, being co-producers, if you will, of, of your film, your, your product, whatever it is. So you want to focus on the one to three things that are going to get you to your goal in less than 10 days. And what I mean by that is, you know, you, you can go after PR, you can go after bloggers, you can go uh, product development, you can do some events, all the stuff that's out there, right? But really sit down and think about it. It's like, okay, what is the one to three things that are going to make me the most money in the shortest amount of time, and then focus on those three things. And it's going to be different depending on the project, but really try to whittle that down. Um, and when, when I say have an effective plan, the, the illustration I give is if you think about a boxer, right? So boxers show up to the ring, they beat the hell out of each other for 12 rounds, they go home, someone wins, everyone's happy, right? But what you don't see is the amount of preparation it took to actually get to that point in their career where they have that fight. So boxers train for months and months at a time. They study tape, they train, they study tape, they train, they study tape, they train. You need to do the same thing with crowdfunding. You need to find projects that are similar. You need to write down what made them successful. You need to find out who's connected to those projects, who are those influencers, and then really start pulling together lists of people, of influencers, of successful campaigns that are like yours, and then really taking that information and then pushing it into a funnel to go throughout your campaign. So, let's see, I'm just scrolling through some notes here. Okay, so if you focus your energy and your team correctly, you should have no problem raising one-third of your goal in one quarter of the time. Um, so a good way to do this and, and, and try to set a realistic goal amount is look how many people you have in your network. So let's just say that between Facebook, LinkedIn, my personal contacts that aren't on either, Twitter people that I follow, et cetera, let's just say I have 1,000 people. Think about converting 1% of those with an average donation of $50 and then do that for each team member. So if that total comes to, you know, 5,000 bucks, you know, Make that like, okay, here's maybe my 25% mark of my goal, and then set your goal according. So the, the initial, th the, the trick to this is you want to raise a lot of money in a very short period of time, and what that does is it gives the project validity. So if no one wants to be the first one to the dance. So if you're sitting there and you have like this project and you post it on Kickstarter and you're kind of just like waiting for people to kind of come and give, it's, it's not going to work. It's not going to happen. You might raise a little bit of money, but you're not going to get the growth that you need to really blow this thing out of the park. So what you want to do is you want to front load those donations. And how you do that is you make a list of these people that could donate or that should donate to you, people from your personal network. And you want to start reaching out to them proactively and saying, hey, John, hey, Sue, hey, Bill, whatever. You know, I've been pouring my heart and soul into this uh, new project for the last six months, a year, whatever it is. It would really mean a lot to me if you could check it out and support me by giving $50 or more. Okay? Now, what I did there is I didn't say, hey, check this video out. Let me know what you think. I gave him a specific, I had a specific ask in there. Will you give me $50 or more? Right? Because if you don't make it specific, People are just going to, you know, they're not going to respond. But if it's someone in my personal network who comes to me and says, hey, Eli, I got this project. If you can help me out, can you give me $50? It would really mean a lot. But can you do it on the first day of the campaign? You know, and if it's someone that I trust and respect, I'd be like, yeah, absolutely. You know, here's 50 bucks. You know, best of luck to you, buddy. Um, 
so that's how you front load and you want to try to hit that first you know 20 to 40 percent right away you also can run an incentive program to get some of these early adopters to come in and giving them a, a bigger discount or a better deal on one of the perks so think about running a campaign for the first five days um, and offering maybe a $50 perk at a $25 value or a $100 perk at a $50 value, whatever, just to kind of get those, that yeah, oil in that machine and kind of get this thing pumping, right? And when you notice Kickstarter, Indiegogo, they have that little green bar, right? It says, you know, 0%, 100%. You want that needle to start moving faster, faster the better, even if you have to kind of get it a disc and get it going. Um, deadline, so let's talk about good deadlines. Um, I, I know, I don't know the uh, numbers on Kickstarter, but the exact numbers on Indiegogo. Uh, 43 days is the average length of the successful campaign. So you want to, there's people that say, oh, you know, I'm going to run this thing for six months. You can do that, but it's better if you just focus your energy to within a four to six weeks time, within a four to six week timetable. And that's just going to keep your team from getting burned out and whatnot. Um, share your social network identities so facebook twitter youtube etc that helps you make you more accessible and real some people are like oh, i don't want to share my facebook i don't want to share my twitter you know share you know people back people they don't back projects um okay let's talk about team so you want to have more than just you on this team and if you got to beg people if you got to convince in-laws or brothers or sisters or cousins whatever it is to help you make sure you do that because a team of four or more people raises 70% more money than someone of just one. There's no more army of ones in these things, okay? So here's like the functions you need, or that's ideal to have. You want a project manager, and this is someone that's more detail oriented, it's more like the whip cracker. They're gonna make everything go, and they're gonna be checking the schedule, they're gonna be checking deadlines, and they're gonna be following up and helping make sure that people are accountable for their tasks throughout the project. You want to have a social media head. This doesn't have to be a social media guru. It just has to be someone that knows how to use the computer, knows the basic elements of Facebook and Twitter, LinkedIn, and is going to be diligent about posting and reaching out to influencers to help share the message. Video head. Who is going to be in charge of making the videos? You don't need to have these things super cinematic, but you need to have somebody that's going to be consistent um, with, with editing the original video and making it compelling, but also posting video updates. So if you post an update a day, statistically proven, you're going to raise 80% more money. Just how it is. Um, content head. So you need someone that can actually write and write succinctly and be able to back up the video. Uh, design head. If you guys have any logos, lower thirds, you're going to put in the video, um, infographs, anything like that. You know, basically have someone to kind of pull that all together and task them with that. Um, so let's talk about the video. So the first thing you want to make sure is you explain why you're doing this. So, you know, like I said before, people don't fund projects, people fund people. So if you can sit there and say, look, you know, it's not I'm selling a new iPhone case because I want to make a lot of money. It's, you know, I'm doing this because I'm tired of dropping my iPhone and having it break. I'm tired of these high cost alternatives that cost $80. I found a new way to make a better iPhone case. It's made out of sustainable materials. It's bamboo, whatever. So for those of you who like to save the earth and like your iPhone, buy one of these. Something like that, right? But just share why you're doing what you're doing and then invite people with you to make the difference that you're making and help them co-create the product. You know, help them, have them vote on colors, you know, do all that good stuff. Um, you also need to make sure what makes you qualified to do it. Right? So either yourself or someone on your team needs to have the necessary know-how in order to pull this off. And you need to demonstrate that shortly, but, but concisely in the video and in the copy. Right? So what makes you qualified to do what you're going to do? Um, let's see here. You can also talk about the perks for participating. Don't go into a whole lot of detail, but if you want to highlight some of the perks, uh, video is an awesome way to do that. Um, okay, so let's talk about making the video. So if you don't have professional video equipment, don't worry. You can use a webcam like I'm using now. You can use your iPhone. If you're going to use your iPhone to shoot a video, shoot it this way, not this way, okay? Landscape, portrait. No on portrait, yes on landscape. Um, otherwise, you're going to have those big black bars on the side. That's, it just sucks. Um, other video tools you can use. Powtoon, animate this. Um, those are two really easy ones to use that make kind of like these little animated clips. 
Um, it's, and I'm moving really fast, but I only have 10 minutes here. So it's talking to the copy. So the main purpose of the copy, the, the sole purpose, is to reinforce what you're saying in the video. So you want to use the copy to go into more detail. Don't make a 10 minute long video. Make it two to three minutes, four or five if it's a more complicated project or a complicated uh, product. But go in more detail in the copy. So this is kind of where you talk about the team and you know give more shots of the product. Um, don't just make it all script. So I usually do it with a lot of uh, text, picture, text, picture, text, picture. And if you do that, it kind of breaks up the flow and doesn't look like something's going to be some big, hard, long read. Do call outs and bold on that copy for key points. And that kind of, if someone's scanning, they can sit there and you know say, you know, iPhone case, 100% sustainable materials. Um, you know, you can vote on the color, you know, eight to choose from, that kind of thing. Um, let's see here. Just scroll and hold on here. Okay, perks. Okay, so perks are the benefits you can offer in exchange for contribution. So I, I always suggest lower level perks, um, especially a dollar. The, the reason, most people say, well, you know, I don't want people if they're only willing to commit a dollar, but here's the thing, if someone believes in your idea, but they just don't want it, but they're like, you know what, I don't have an iPhone, but you're making a sustainable iPhone case, and I believe in sustainability, so here, here's a buck to you, right? By doing that, if someone contributes a dollar, all my social contacts, if I share it on Facebook or Twitter, or if, I, if people are following me on, on uh, Kickstarter or Indiegogo, they're going to see that I donated to that project. They're not going to see how much, so it just starts to add... Uh, social reliability or social credibility, excuse me, uh, to the network. Um, so one dollar contribution can actually garner you know, thousands. I'm if it's the right person. You want to offer discounts, exclusive or limited edition items. You know, and so make it something that's appealing to where someone's, you know, you're not just going to go sell some cheap pen uh, that I can just go buy down the street, right? You're going to sell a t-shirt, fine, um, but make it something that's, you know, you've designed. Um, coffee mugs, that kind of stuff. Anything that's tangible is, uh, is really good to have. Um, also, you need to price them accordingly. So if you say, hey, donate 100 bucks or more and we're going to give you a t-shirt, that isn't a very good product. Or it, it's just not a good perk because it's just so far out there. Would you yourself spend $100 on a t-shirt? I wouldn't. Most people wouldn't, so price them accordingly. Um, so, let's see here. Okay, so, let's see here. I already said that. So, personal emails with a specific ask are statistically the most effective. Um, here's a quick little hack. Um, when you're first getting started, create a Facebook event, put your campaign in it with a link, and then invite all your friends. And a really good uh, way to do that is just get the add all Facebook friends extension on Google Chrome. That's gonna allow you to make the event, you hit select all, it's gonna select them all and then send it and then everyone knows about what you're doing. So it's a, it's a real good way to kind of do a shotgun approach. I would do some updates on Facebook, some posts first leading up to that to say, hey, you know, I'm doing this new project. Here's some first look at the designs. You know, what, tell me what you guys think. And just kind of start getting people conditioned to know that this thing's coming rather than just blasting them and they have no clue what this is. Um, okay, updates. You know, you want to keep the updates coming. Um, if you want to get uh, 13 or more updates, it leads to 60% more money than campaigns with only five updates. That's just a quick fact. Um, Campaigns which send out regular updates reach, on average, more than 100% of their goal. Um, and the name of the game with updates is continued engagement. So people always say, well, I don't, I don't know what to, to put in an update. Well, think about this. Make it an update to address questions that are being asked by the community either before, during, or during the campaign. So people say, hey, you know, are you going to come out with any other color than black? Yeah, we are. We're going to come out with this, this, and this, and you actually get a vote on it. Hey, you know, where did you source the material? We actually got this from a, a, a Taiwan, an eco-friendly plant. Things like that. Things that just kind of give information but still involve your audience. Um, 
referral contests are extremely lucrative. So you can, in Indiegogo, you can actually track in the dashboard where your referrals are coming from and if that person pledged. So I can see that, you know, Jim, Bob, and Sue, so Bob referred, you know, 500 people to the campaign, Sue referred 10, Tom, referred, you know, Sue, you know, whatever, referred five. And then I can see out of those referrals, how many of them actually turn into donations. So think about running a contest for like a, a prize of like, hey, you know, whoever refers the most amount this week, you know, gets a free, I don't know, gets 10, 10 iPhone cases, right? Or gets a free pass to the premiere or whatever. And then for the updates, you can actually put the, the take a screenshot of that dashboard and stick it on it. You can do the same on Kickstarter. It's just a little bit more of a pain in the ass. You just got to take um, like an external link service where you can track like Bitly or something um, and just work it up that way. Um, okay, so talking about stranger dollars. So to get stranger dollars, you got to promote to audiences that are going to care. And the, the best way to do this, uh, or a real simple way to do this, is go to dofollowblogfinder.net. So again, that's do follow blogfinder.net and all you got to do is you just type in what you were looking for so let's just say it's a uh, iPhone cases right just have, pop that in and it's going to pull a list of all these different blogs that are writing about iPhone cases and so when you're starting to, to develop that list of people you want to reach out to the stranger community identify which bloggers are talking about this already and then pitch them, say, hey, look, I know that you're talking about iPhone cases, especially the OtterBox 5, uh, whatever, but I have a new case. It's better because it's sustainable. It comes in more colors. Whatever that pitch is, craft it specifically to that reporter, and then get them and convince them to do an article on your project. So people aren't interested in writing about Kickstarter campaigns, but they are interested in writing about new projects, especially ones that have a little bit of juice. Um, Another way to uh, find uh, influential, influential bloggers is the site uh, Technorati. You can type in uh, what type of subject or matter you're looking for, and it'll show you influential blogs. Another uh, way to check those blogs is pull an Alexa ranking. An Alexa ranking, uh, just go to alexa.com, A-L-E-X-A.com. And you just basically uh, pull up the blog, uh, copy the URL, drop it into Alexa, and then it will show you a score. And the lower the score, the better performing the blog it is. So it just basically looks at the traffic and how many outbound links and how many inbound links, and it gives it a score. Um, let's see here. OK. So let's, OK, and then when you're talking about you know, reaching out to these bloggers, it's going to come into four things. And I pulled this off of a post um, that was written by Tim Ferriss. But it's called the, uh, the four R's. So relevance. Will the readers identify with your project? Okay. Readership. How many people does this uh, site traffic get? Relationships. Do you know, know at least one person that can make an introduction? If not, don't worry. Still contact them. That makes it a little easier for you. A good way to find out if you do have those relationships um, is LinkedIn or Facebook. And then reach. Uh, Will they actually promote this blog other than just posting it? Will they send it out a newsletter? Will they tweet it? Will they Facebook it? I just wanted to ha um, kind of give you a time warning of like a minute. Sure. If you could wrap up and then we'll have people ask you questions if you're okay with that. I mean, I just like, I could see you yep. just keep going and going. You've got so much to share and it's really valuable. Yeah, you bet. You bet. And I think. Um, so these are the last. Uh, so this is it. So the, here's the suggested plan. So you want to blast the email campaign out to as many inner circle friends as possible to get going. You want to have them fund and forward. That's like the whole trick here, have them fund and forward, because statistically, a personal email ask to that internal network is more powerful than any amount of PR, social media, anything. Okay, So get it to your inner circle and have them fund and forward to their inner circles and have them fund and forward to their inner circles, right? because it's coming from a trusted source. Um, get influencers uh, to basically write about you and blog about you, and then get pressed to amplify those efforts. So, and then if you have any other questions on where to go after that, repeat steps one and two. Blast them forward to inner, inner circle friends, have them fund it for it. Uh, so that's it.
That's great. That's great. I mean, I think what you're really pointing to is all kind of the tools of how to make these connections with people and really how to get them on board and excited. And yeah, there are just some really nice specific things that every, all of us can do. Hi, Eli. It's Dave. Uh, just for the crowd, for the team here, um, can you point to a project that you think embodies a lot of these values? I think that they've, the one that got it right, the one that uh, ticked all the boxes, that sort of thing. doesn't really matter what it is, just to use it as a kind of template. Um, yeah, you can go to Adams Express on Kickstarter. So AT, here we go. So Adams Express, A-T-O-M-S Express. Um, we took uh, eight weeks to plan this thing. Uh, there was a team of, of literally 12 people. Some of them were just uh, product developers, but it was a, they involved the community in Boulder, Colorado. They did several events leading up to uh, the launch. So and a, they did meetup groups, just like you guys are doing right now. They visited various meetup groups and said, here's what we're doing. What do you guys think? You know, enter your email address in our site, and we're going to let you guys know these new updates. And so they had, uh, within the first 24 hours, they had $25,000 come through the door, and they didn't have a very extensive network of friends and family that had big bucks. So what they had to do is they had to hustle to build that network ahead of time, and they only had two months to do it. So it can be done. You just got to make sure that you're diligent and you're on it and you're finding all those relevant meetup groups. And I mean, just like Melissa and George are putting this meetup group on here, find other meetup groups in your area that would resonate with what you're trying to do or would connect with what you're trying to do. Okay, so so um, one of the participants, Yorgi, is asking how to do this if you don't have a lot of followers and it's, you don't have a huge base to start with. I think you've touched on it already. Yeah. But maybe, maybe top three things they could do who just doesn't have a big social media network yet. Okay, yeah, so here's the thing. So if you don't have a big social media network, you got to connect with people um, and, and, and start building that social network. So give yourself ample time to plan. If you guys are trying to like launch these campaigns, you're not spending, you know, at least four weeks, you know, to, to, to launch, you're, you're probably setting yourself up for failure. So I usually give myself six to eight weeks before launching, and that gives me time to you know, get the people to meetup groups, um, get them talking to influencers in the community, identifying all the forms and having those conversations ahead of time. So just because you personally right now don't have it, doesn't mean you can't have it in two months. You just got to start being diligent about really getting yourself out there and connecting with those people. I think yeah, this is really, thank you so much. It was very concrete information, so well put together. It was really nice to have you come in to the Boston, Cambridge, the feed, and out to the rest of the world. So thank you. Thank you very much. Absolutely, guys. Everyone have a good day. Just a personal observation on two projects. Um, our first project last July, uh, we blundered into it um, just to figure it out. And you know, we're going to have fun. Spam our friends, like you said, um, and and that included my plumber, my my auto mechanic, my barber, you know. and um, so we literally grabbed every email address of every human being that had ever handed us a business card or all of that. And we threw them all in one big pot. Um, but uh, I think to agree with him here is simply putting a project up on Kickstarter does nothing whatsoever for you. Um, it's just a right to play. Uh, you have to drive all of your own traffic. And that's hard. As that is the hardest thing that no one really knows about is how do you get so many people in. And we did kind of a back of the envelope calculation where um, we said if somebody had watched our video all the way through, because you get a little control panel at the end, which gives you all the statistics of what's going on on a minute by minute basis in, on your project. And in the video, um, you can see how many people viewed it versus how many people pledged. And it literally was 5% the people who watched your video all the way through actually pledged. And um, we did some Facebook promotions in, and so we knew how many people we pushed our um, project to and how many actually went to the site. So our working number right now is it takes 400 people who see something about you to generate one pledge. So if you're going to PR, uh, it's like, 5% click through and 5% pledge. Kind of work that back out, that's how that is. So that's the hardest thing is um, how do you get traffic and um, hiring a PR agency. Hire people to go out and do it for you. If it's 
if the money's important to you, um, it's worth giving a little of that back up to pay the PR agency, a couple grand. Public relations people. Well, they're, they have a network of magazines, blogs, television, radio, sending your press release out. They go out and create buzz like they do for anybody. Well, we spend about four to six grand per engagement. We did a little thing last year where we said, you know, we were already on our way to 100,000, and they showed, the ad agency showed up and said, hey, we want your business. And we said, well, we're doing just fine. We kind of played coy. Doing just fine. But if you want to show us what you can do, we'll give you a piece. We'll give you 10% of whatever you're able to do above 100000 And they, they made a lot of money on that one because <laughs> they brought in about $75,000 worth of uh, people that I give them credit for. Yeah. Yeah. Try that one. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I think that's um, Adam Express. Okay, yeah, he um, that's the agency Eli used. Um, there's some major programs out there, like the Oya uh, game console, you may have seen. I think they pulled in around $10 million. You bet. They had a huge machine built up in the front, whipping up demand weeks and months in advance of actually launching the project. So that was a very professional organization. There's no product that is that cool that $10 million show up in the space of 30 days without an engineered PR campaign. So I would add to that too that um, you want an agency that has access to those kinds of blogs because we call it, we call them in, internally alpha blogs. They're the ones that um, everyone's looking to to copy because tomorrow morning there'll be 50 blogs that have copied the first blog and Two days later, there'll be 150 blogs that will copy the second blogs. <laughs> and so you want the guys that are at, at the head of the, to have a watershed. TechCrunch, my world's technology, so TechCrunch is one of them. Um, Cult of Mac, there's, you know, Enigadget and Gizmodo certainly are all big, big alpha blogs that everyone's, the minor bloggers are sort of looking to them and then repeating their stories. It's kind of how it works, so. Um, running a project <laughs> and seeing which one drives traffic and seeing which one shows up and see in your control panel you'll see at the end during the project you'll see where the bit the pledges are coming from and they'll constantly be updating you know if there's something that lands on we had a mention in, in a gadget and sure enough you know by noon there's you know 20 bid 20 pledges came from there by three o'clock in the afternoon there was a hundred and then you could see secondary blogs start to show up and if you went and took the time to go check, you'd see that the secondary blogs were just parroting whatever was said on in a gadget, and, and, and you create this watershed effect. But it took a professional PR agency to really kind of make that happen. You know, we're going to have a whole range of those of us who kind of step out and into the deep end and find out that we're drowning and just pull the plug and, you know, jump off the diving board a second time. And I think that's totally fine. I mean... I think it's getting started is the key. And then there's others who are taking all the experience they have of their whole lifetime into their first project, and you know, and they're going to come out of it in a really different kind of way and be able to use a lot of resources that they have from their other entrepreneurial work. And you know, so I think it's just natural that there's going to be this large range, especially something like this, where it is an even playing field in the beginning. I mean, it doesn't cost anything to put it up on the platform. And so everybody really has the chance, but whether it'll succeed or not, it might take a couple tries. And why not? That's a cheap education compared to probably 20 years of <laughs> running one's own business, actually, you know? So, and I think this is a nice segue into Elon Amran. Um, what he really wants to do, he's been watching the crowdfunding for a while and just seeing what, you know, what he could offer everyone. So it's really coming in from this more community place, which is sort of why we're here. And he has some great case studies. He's also heard a lot of different stories. So that if he doesn't touch on them in the dialogue, we should really ask him. He had just some really interesting ones.
One of the directions that might be nice to hear from you is, you know, the, I know that like I have a friend that had one of these Kindle projects and she hit number one and she was like all by herself in her room. And she just said that was like the worst moment in her life. Like, you know, like all this work and, you know, she made it and there she was. So I'd like you to talk a little bit about Schmoozebiz and the community and why you started it in terms of us not doing this alone. Like you touched on it a little bit. But I think um, you've, you know, you put a lot of effort into it. It's in beta testing. Maybe we could help you out to to kind of join and see. But just if you could talk a little bit about that, like not doing it alone, kind of feeling. Okay, what, what Schmooze Biz is all about is it's a it's a website that actually has integrated features in it from Facebook and LinkedIn, um, and it, it's a location where you can come to and gather and help each other work on projects. And we, we have a lot of different things on there uh, that will give you that interactive capabilities. Um, so, so just like with Facebook, you create an account and um, you post your interests and the kind of people you'd like to meet. And you can actually post a campaign, if you have a campaign that actually is, uh, is running right now, um, or post something that you're going to be working on in the future and ask the crowd, the people in, in Schmooze Biz to help you out with it. And, and so it gives you the ability to interact um, and, and, and find people with a like mind and interest, primarily in crowdfunding, uh, to help you with your campaign. Whether it's someone to help you with the consulting aspect of it, to manage a project, um, or even to discuss the success you've had with a project and, and try to get others to utilize some, some of the ideas that you have. Um, it, it's a gathering place to reach out to the community. Um, and so you, you have different things that you can do there also. One of the unique features that we've uh, implemented on Schmooze Biz is we have what we call a Schmooze Box Live. And Schmooze Box Live is a small little um, window chat box that's open and can be seen by anyone that's actually online on SchmoozeBiz and you can communicate and interact live with the entire crowd that's on SchmoozeBiz. And it's available on different sections within SchmoozeBiz. So we have a main page which is like the main feed on Facebook and, um, and then we have a pages section and in the pages section you can post your campaign, uh, create a page for your campaign and interact and communicate with others and also have a schmooze box live on your pages section for your particular campaign. So if you have a live campaign and you want to interact like for example on Kickstarter you do not have the ability to communicate and interact live or even leave comments on a campaign unless you've already contributed to that campaign. So one of the advantages is if you posted your campaign on SchmoozeBiz, you have the ability to communicate with other people um, it, regarding your campaign, whether or not they have contributed. So you, you have a, a way to answer, ask, and communicate with others um, within the site and uh, regarding your campaign. We'll have other features available uh, coming up. One of them will be a marketplace and in that marketplace you'll actually be able to take any of the products that you've developed and post them in the marketplace for others uh, that after you finished your campaign you could still provide and sell your product uh, to the general product, uh, general public through the marketplace. Good, good. Okay, great, Elon. Thank you so much. Post your URL so everybody can have a chance to check out what he's doing. Thank right, you. So uh, one of the apprehensive moments, obviously, is we ship products anyway, so we have a warehouse and we have a way of doing that, but we had to have a whole team to move goods into 38 countries. And uh, a big shock was uh, uh, learning with the average shipping price to get something to Singapore. You know, a two pound box to Singapore is like forty-five dollars <laughs> and and uh, if you're not doing your math on your project like here's what I want to get and here's what I'm the pledge is going to be oh Kickstarter gets five percent Amazon gets three and a half then there's shipping it starts to whittle away at whatever profit you thought you might want to get out of that so that's another planning problem at least for product people 
is uh, newbies getting into the product game for the very first time and then going on to Kickstarter. They don't do their um, financial math right, and they find out that they're upside down. They actually lose money <laughs> from the shipping part. But um, I'd have to add the, the strategy part is really critical, and we were talking at the beginning the Kickstarter Go button when you launch, when you've been approved and you're ready to go, is absolutely the last thing you do. Um, up until then, it's about it's lining everybody up. The press, we were talking about the press earlier. You can ask the press to wait until Monday. You can embargo your story if you've got a bunch of press contacts that are going to report on it so that everybody reports at the moment of the project launch. So that's pretty standard stuff. Um, so anyway, it's it's... I, I can see a lot of help I can give you on just project strategy, let alone you know how you handle it. Another piece that I would add is once you get into a project, we haven't talked about that at all, is the it's a community. I, I call it crowdfinding because all of a sudden you've got 2,000 self-selected, passionate people that love the heck out of you, and you got to love them back. I, I say it's like sitting in the chef's kitchen. They're wanting to watch you do something. It's performance art. They're wanting to watch you unfold what it takes to make something happen because um, we did a poll at the end of our, our first project uh, where we let people comment on six different reasons why they, they backed our project. It was to be first, to get something cheap, to buy something cool. Our products are particularly environmentally thoughtful because of the social aspect or the environmental aspect, to back an inventor, or to buy something that I wanted. And number one and number two, without question, was to buy something I wanted and to back an inventor. And I can't even remember what number three was. So it wasn't about saving money, although that's kind of nice. But it's not, people aren't going there to get something cheap. They're not going there to get something free or be first. They really want to go there to back a person and get something I like. They're getting something they want out of it. So I think you got to make sure you give them something that they want. Um, so the idea of, um, giving them a little bit of performance of you know sending out a little update once a week uh, for instance and you come up with little things to tell about your project that you don't even think about anymore because you're a professional and this is what you do we got for instance these little sewn fabric tags that are at the corner of our speaker that have our logo on it and we just did a, an update that said hey the tags are in aren't they cool we spread them out on the table and took a picture the, the update took like two minutes to put up and we got a slew of love from the crowd. Um, I remember in the middle of the night one time a guy wrote to me on, the, on our first project. We'd found out a way to plug two of our speakers together and make them stereo. We couldn't do that in the beginning, but everyone was asking for it, so we figured out a way to do it. And the guy wrote in and he says, hey, lo how long is the wire between the two speakers? And I said, how long do you want it to be, Bob? And uh, he says, well, 38 inches would be great. And I said, okay, Bob, it's 38 inches. And he was thrilled. He said, no one's ever asked my opinion before. I said, Bob, not only that, it's now called the Bob Wire. And, and, and having that engagement and leaving wet ink in the project where people can comment, because you'll every once in a while you'll get, like our second project, we had this little ice cube thing. It's made out of stainless steel. And, and by the end of the project, we'd changed the design, and people went nuts. They were mad. They thought we'd kind of sold them on one idea and changed it after the fact. We said, hey, sorry, we'll make them both. Don't worry about it. And and because the crowd can go pitchforks and torches pretty quick, and and you got to be ready for some some of that. So, um, in the middle of the project, you've got to be just agile and responsive, and update frequently. I don't know about every day, but um, once a week I think is probably fair. Um, I think a lot of the projects that I've seen that have failed um, uh, see it as a transaction. They're trying to make money, and they're just moving goods and selling something, and it it. It is the chef's kitchen thing, where you're sitting in the kitchen, you want to watch Emeril cook a chicken. You're never going to cook chicken yourself, but you want to walk into a party and say, hey, I learned something about cooking chicken, you know, from Emeril. I sat in his kitchen. And that's kind of the dynamic. They want to walk away knowing and learning something. So we'll show them the inside of our machine shop. We'll show them the lathe, turning the pieces and little bits of the metal flying off. That's fun, you know. We don't think about it, but it's fun to tell. So we're always looking for little stories to throw out there. And, you know, when number one box got shipped out, we wrote number one on it and said thank you, wrote all over the box. And we took a picture of the, the post office guy. He was pretty buff, so he looked good holding the box, you know. 
And uh, so, and we took pictures, sequence of pictures of the truck driving off, and everyone kind of cheered, and we had a lot of fun with that. So, um, it's uh, you have a, I use my iPhone for everything. My 15-year-old son does all my videos. So, um, just, well, if you have a little um, update page when you have your project, uh, there's a little button that says "Add Video," "Add Photos," "Add." Oh yeah. Got to do that. Yeah, everybody, every human being. <laughs> well, I, I, I did, so I'm on my second project now. The first one, I just sent personal emails. I said, hey, everybody, you're getting in this email because you're a friend of mine, or I know you, or we have a professional relationship. And... You know, I hate to hit you up, but here's how it works. I'm going to spam you every single day for the next week until this project launches. If you don't want to hear from me, please let me know. I'll pull you off the list. I said, but I could really use your support. I said, and I got I to gotta sell like crazy to get this project off the ground, and I really want you to get behind me. And if it's not for you, pass it along. You know, I know it's not for everybody, you know, because who likes to open an email box? It's full of spam. I said, but it's coming. You know, and I span my sisters and you know uncles and aunts and everybody, every human being, and uh, and they joined in. And so by the second project, I did a little more formal thing with um, Emma. It's an emailing database thing. They send out like professional newsletters and so things like that, uh, where I gathered all those emails into that database, and I could send out nice, crafted things with photos in it and links to the Kickstarter page and. Don't ever send anything that doesn't have a link to your Kickstarter page. Everything's a funnel into the page. So your Facebook page has daily posts, hey, our Kickstarter project just took off, and link, link. Everything has a link in it. Hi, Bob, it's Dave. Uh, is my car done yet? By the way, visit my Kickstarter project. Yeah. But our Linda and I saw Amanda Palmer, who had an interesting take. Yeah. Right, yes. So she's famous for her TED Talks. I mean, she's famous for being, you know, a great musician, and people in the Boston area really know her because she's from here. Uh, but uh, we went to see her at Marketplace, uh, at, at Muse and Marketplace, which is, you know, where all the writers and wannabe writers go, uh, and it's sort of a, a great annual conference for people to, you know, in that space, to connect, network, find an agent you know, get inspired to finish their book and so on. But, you know, so they had brought her in because I think the publishing world is looking to find a model for, you know, how do you sort of get people interested? You know, how do you reach your crowd in a way? Um, now that the technology is changing and the way that you sort of put yourself out there, the market is changing, in other words, and the way that you reach your audience may be changing. You know, there's e-books, you know, how do people consume the content and so on? So they brought her in as a as a way of sort of getting some insights from the music industry, which has you know I mean that that industry has been disrupted you know long time ago. And so what what you know I think her insights were sort of how do you as a person as a brand as an artist um, put yourself out there? How do you communicate uh, with your audience? And the key is, yeah, this connection that you have to foster, and um, you know, and she does it well. She's very, very big on Twitter. I mean, that's sort of the the key, you know. And we haven't mentioned Twitter all that much, but I think that you know, for me, Twitter is it more so than Facebook because it's this kind of open source, um, you know, forum for finding finding your you know the people who are interested in your project and then communicating directly with them you just sign up you you know you follow people and they follow you i think the one piece of it that doesn't we haven't touched on so much is sort of this idea that okay you are out there and you want to communicate something now why would people care beyond you you know what are you trying to communicate that would be galvanizing interest and an audience you know you have to think very very you know, carefully about that. One of the things that they say at the beginning of the Kickstarter when you're setting up your new project, they tell you to write a story. This is not a project, it's a story. And so this story component's really powerful. And Amanda's one of them that has her has a story to tell. And and it's fun to be part of that story. 
I mean, you're you're saying the same thing about your projects, and in a way that you are trying to get the story element in. I think you're trying to get yourself connecting with your audience, with your network, as a way of them having you know backing you up. But but beyond that, you know, I mean, she's she's an artist, and people appreciate her work. And I think what she's done, and what I think is changing uh, about the marketplace, is that um, you know you just have to share more in a sense and this is something that I personally have you know sort of I'm trying to wrestle with this idea what it used to be is that it was a one-way street you know uh, so in publishing you have a book you publish it the publisher distributes it through the bookstores you go buy the book you read the book that's it these days you can reach you know there's a feedback loop you can go to the artist and then now that the platforms of you know publishing content, putting it out there, are being disrupted, it, it's most definitely a two-way conversation. So what Melissa is doing is she's she's written a memoir, and in a way she's revising it. But you know, this is an interesting way of connecting with the audience while you're doing it, in a way. And, and, and so that there is, well, there's you can follow the process. I mean, that's fun. It's This is postmodernism. I think that's what postmodernism is, that you understand all the mechanics of it. Uh, and then and then you, you can participate in the process. I think that is the fun of it. It's sort of play, you know? That's what children do. They play. They interact with each other. As adults, I think this is kind of the time when we're kind of coming into it a little more. And I think that is what we're rediscovering. That's why Facebook, I mean, everybody's on Facebook, and that's why I think they liked it. It's the interactivity of it. But you know, I think it's, yes, the key is the interactivity, uh, that you can reach your, your you know, the artist. Uh, and you can ask them a question. You can tell them, hey, you know, I didn't like this song so much. I love the other one better. You know, Can you play that for me? I mean, you go to a concert these days, you you know, the artist will be on Twitter. You can tell them what you want them to sing for you. They may or may not, you know, respond to that. But I mean, that's the fun part of sort of where we are. And I think the more con genuine connection you have, I think that's what she talked about, being genuine. Um, and I think we, you know, the more you are on Twitter, the more you realize this, is that you, you're able to, if, if, if your message and your story are genuine, then yes, you're you're going to find the people, and and, and it's going to be great. It's 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 not the one way conversation. When I was sort of starting this whole thing out, that women, not to be so gender based, but I noticed <laughs> being gender based <laughs> that really a lot of a lot of women were stepping out, not knowing any of the basics, like not really understanding how to use Twitter or Facebook or even email. I mean, it was really when I started to kind of go through and survey Kickstarter, first of all, it, only 20% of the projects were directed by women, and most of them had zero dollars pledged. I mean, it was really a sad um, realization. So I did do a very, it's, it's a very feminine, gushy style, but I really do detail how to use Facebook, how to use Twitter, how to email your friends, how to do the analytics, which I think is really vital, is watching that, so where you're putting your energy in is actually has results. So I can, Beth, I can sign you up. I can also put this up on the board. And right now there's eight of these strategies. They're called like outrageous love to you and your project. They they really handhold you through, you know, with like, you know, because I think for women in particular, this is something that we've as a gender and as a culture to go out and ask for money is really gutsy, you know, and and that's something kind of where you've got to do it. I mean, it's almost like you have to ring that doorbell and say, you know, shake the little what UNICEF, you know, I don't know about you, but that was hard even as a kid, you know, to do. So I think that's particular, but Beth, I think some of these basic things, I could definitely help you out and send you some of that information. And it's a very active group. I have a Facebook group where the women are adorable. I mean, they're so supportive and they're actually giving money to each other, you know, little donations, but it makes you feel like, okay, I'm not alone in this and it's a way to get started. Um, and not like, I mean, Amanda Palmer, you know, is a total pro and and I think one of the interesting things that she brought up was this, you know, you cannot be in the ivory tower anymore. You cannot be looking down at your audience. You've got to get down the stairwell, open that door, get into, you know, the Marrakesh market and, you know, get bumped around and 
you know, and, and really kind of smell the sense of the market and, and see and feel and touch what, what people are really after and, and decide that's what you want to do or not. You know, you can kind of take a side road and, and really be in the world of a, you know, a specific way that you want to be and interact, and then that's going to be your audience. So I think, you know, that's that's a really big change. So guys, thank you so much for coming, and um, I'll send out the URLs and, you know, whatever information. Thank you, thank you, and thanks, George and Jesse.